When presented with an x-ray of a patient with right middle lobe pneumonia, the first finding that you may notice is an area of consolidation. The presence of fluid density material within the right middle lobe results in a wedge-shaped opacity in the right lower zone adjacent to the heart. Another finding that is a little more difficult to appreciate is the presence of air bronchograms. Air-filled bronchi that are surrounded by alveolar infiltrates can appear as dark, radiolucent branching columns within the area of opacification. Consolidation of the right middle lobe results in effacement of the right heart border, obscuring the interface between the lung and the heart. This is referred to as the silhouette sign. Lastly, note that the superior border of the right hemidiaphragm is clearly defined. This helps to differentiate a right middle lobe pneumonia from a right lower lobe pneumonia, in which case the right hemidiaphragm would be obscured. So to quickly recap, on an x-ray depicting right middle lobe pneumonia, we would expect to see right lower zone opacification with air bronchograms and an indistinct right heart border, but with a clearly demarcated right hemidiaphragm. I'll also add that unless there is coinciding atelectasis, there is usually no loss of lung volume. As well, keep in mind that radiographic evidence of pneumonia can worsen during the first few days of treatment and take several weeks to completely resolve. When presented with an x-ray of a patient with right lower lobe atelectasis, the first finding that you may notice is an area of increased opacification. Atelectasis of the right lower lobe results in a triangular density medially at the right lung base. Collapse of the right lower lobe results in effacement of the right heart border, obscuring the interface between the lung and the heart. This is referred to as the silhouette sign. Note that the interface between the lung and the medial aspect of the right hemidiaphragm is also obscured. Atelectasis may also result in signs of decreased lung volume, which can include ipsilateral tracheal deviation, depression of the minor fissure, and elevation of the right hemidiaphragm, a radiographic sign that is referred to as tenting. So to quickly recap, on an x-ray depicting right lower lobe atelectasis, we might expect to see right lower zone opacification with effacement of the borders between the lung and both the heart and the medial aspect of the right hemidiaphragm, and signs of decreased lung volume, such as ipsilateral tracheal deviation and diaphragmatic tenting. Congestive heart failure can produce a myriad of findings on plain chest radiography. Which findings are present depends on the severity of the patient's condition. On an erect posterior anterior chest x-ray, suggestive findings include cardiomegaly, which does not necessarily need to be present, vascular redistribution, that is, the syphilization of blood flow, pulmonary venous congestion, pulmonary interstitial edema, pleural effusions, and in more severe disease, alveolar edema which is not clearly evident on this radiograph. Cardiomegaly, particularly in concert with other findings, is a suggestive feature of congestive heart failure. However, keep in mind that congestive heart failure can occur in the presence of a normal-sized heart. Cardiomegaly is said to be present when the cardiothoracic ratio is greater than 0.5, that is, when the largest transverse distance between the left and right heart borders of the cardiac silhouette is greater than half the width of the thorax. In this image, the cardiothoracic ratio is approximately 0.6. Now, you should also be aware that on anterior posterior films, determination of heart size is unreliable due to magnification. Vascular redistribution is one of the first signs of congestive heart failure. Increased blood flow to pulmonary vessels in the upper lung zones results in an increase in size relative to blood vessels in the lower lung zones. This caudal to cranial redistribution of blood flow should only be inspected for in an erect x-ray, since equalization of blood flow may occur in the supine position. The finding of upper lobe blood diversion, however, can be difficult to appreciate on a plain radiograph. One other way that it can be identified is by the discovery of a superior lobe artery with a greater diameter than its accompanying bronchus. Now, since it is hard to be certain on this radiograph, this example should be taken for illustrative purposes. The bronchus is the ring-like structure with a hollow center, while the artery is filled in. Normally, the upper lobe artery to bronchus ratio is less than 1 to 1. Here the reverse is seen, with a larger artery than bronchus. 
You may have also noticed the prominence of the hilar region and the widening of the vascular pedicle in this radiograph. The fullness of the right hilum is particularly evident, whereas the left hilum is predominantly obscured by an enlarged cardiac silhouette. Unlike with lymph node enlargement, in which case the hilar can appear as a large lumpy mass, the hilar region in this x-ray has irregular borders due to thickened outward branching vessels. The increase in hilar size, as well as the vascular pedicle widening in this x-ray, are due to pulmonary venous congestion. An edematous interstitium is another important feature of congestive heart failure. Three signs of thickened interstitial tissue include curly beelines, peribronchial cuffing, and interlobal fissure thickening. Curly beelines are fine linear opacities that are only 1 to 2 mm in width. They are typically located peripherally in the lower lung fields near the costophrenic angles. When viewed close up, they can be seen to extend perpendicularly inwards from the pleura and are up to 3 cm in length. These opacities can also be seen head on, in which case they are referred to as curly C lines, or radiating outward from the hyla, in which case they are called curly A lines. Peribronchial cuffing is another discrete finding which occurs due to edema of the bronchial wall. When viewed head on, it appears as a donut or a ring. When viewed tangentially, that is, from the side, it appears as two parallel lines, which to some extent resemble tram tracks. Note that peribronchial cuffing can occur in other conditions as well, such as chronic bronchitis. Also evident in this image is a thickened minor that is horizontal fissure. This finding is easier to detect on a lateral radiograph where both the oblique and horizontal fissures may be visible. Collectively, interstitial edema results in widespread blurring of lung markings. The loss of definition results in a hazy appearance of the lung fields and hilum bilaterally. Now let's turn our attention to the bottom right corner of the radiograph. Note that there is a decrease in definition of the left costal phrenic angle, a finding that is consistent with a pleural effusion. Here is another x-ray of congestive heart failure. In this case, there are bilateral pleural effusions which can be identified by the loss of costophrenic angles and obscured hemidiaphragms. Below the left lung, we see the meniscus sign, in which the opacity has a concave upper border and is higher laterally than medially. Alveolar edema is a more severe sign of congestive heart failure and is not clearly evident in this radiograph that we've thus far been examining. In this image, many of the aforementioned findings of congestive heart failure are present, plus alveolar edema, which classically results in central and symmetrical airspace disease. The outer third of the lung is frequently spared, resulting in a characteristic batwing configuration. However, the patterns of pulmonary opacification are variable and can be more or less diffuse and asymmetric or patchy. To quickly recap, the plain radiographic findings that can occur with congested heart failure include cardiomegaly, signs of vascular redistribution such as cephalization and increased artery to bronchus ratio in superior segments, signs of pulmonary vascular congestion such as hilar enlargement and a widened vascular pedicle, signs of pulmonary interstitial edema such as curly B lines, peribronchial cuffing, and interlobal fissure thickening, pleural effusions, and in more severe cases, alveolar edema. A pneumothorax refers to the presence of gas or air in the pleural space. It is considered a simple pneumothorax when there isn't any mediastinal shift to the contralateral side and the patient is stable. In regards to detecting a pneumothorax, the most important aspect is simply looking for it. The x-ray may be almost entirely normal, except for a small crescent of lucency next to the lung, which can be easy to miss. Can you see a crescent of increased transradiancy in this x-ray? You may need to look closely. This area of increased blackness represents free air. Notice the lack of bronchovesicular markings within this region. A very helpful sign of a pneumothorax is the demarcation of the visceral pleura on the x-ray, which is identified by a thin, sharp white line. This fine hairline opacity occurs between the lateral border of the lung and the free air in the pleural space. Again, notice the lack of pulmonary vascular markings in the area beyond the pleural line. Now if the lung is consolidated, then the visceral pleura won't be distinguishable as a separate line, but rather as the edge of the consolidation. Within the confines of the visceral pleural lines, you can see lung tissue, which can be identified by the presence of lung markings. 
The contralateral lung, however, may appear to have more prominent lung markings due to increased vascular flow. As mentioned earlier, with a simple pneumothorax, the heart and mediastinal structures remain in their natural positions. For example, notice the central position of the trachea in this x-ray. Here is a more obvious x-ray of a pneumothorax. No lung markings are visible beyond the border of the right lung, which has collapsed. Notice the increased opacity of the collapsed right lung in comparison to the normal left lung. As well, the right heart border cannot be identified because the collapsed lung is indistinguishable from the heart. This is referred to as the silhouette sign. And the trachea is central as mediastinal shift has not occurred. Normally, the chest x-ray is performed with the patient on inspiration. Can you detect the pneumothorax on the inspiratory x-ray? Now how about on the expiratory x-ray? Occasionally, the air between the lung and the pleural space is easier to detect with an expiratory image. To quickly recap, with a pneumothorax, a thin sharp white line, the visceral pleura, separates the lung and the free air, which is void of bronchovesicular markings. As well, in the case of a simple thorax, there will not be any signs of mediastinal shift. Now, although most x-rays are taken in the urex position, for the purpose of detecting the pneumothorax anyway, this way air collects superiorly and laterally, unfortunately, not all patients can stand. So when the radiograph is taken with the patient in the supine position, air actually collects basally, which may seem counterintuitive, but in that position, the anterior and lateral calciferinic sulci are actually the highest points in which free pleural air can collect. When air collects in this location, it may result in a deep sulcus sign, which is an indirect sign of a pneumothorax. Spine x-rays, however, lack sensitivity for detecting pneumothorax and should not be relied upon if negative. If the patient cannot stand, then a lateral decubitus x-ray should be taken with the affected lung facing upwards. A skin fold on the chest can result in an abrupt drop-off in opacity, thereby mimicking the radiographic findings of a pneumothorax. A skin fold, however, has a dark band, opposed to a light, at its lateral contour. As well, in the case of skin folds, bronchovesicular markings extend to the periphery of the lung, whereas with a pneumothorax they do not. Keep in mind, however, that apical bronchovesicular markings may be difficult to appreciate.